some sound again, huh? Here we go. All right. So uh, I don't know which uh, which Pueblo this is. Uh, this is a Pueblo woman firing pottery back, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, and and what is traditional in, in Pueblo pottery is firing with cow manure, which is a great fuel because it gets hot. It kind of keeps its shape as it burns. So uh, it stays, and I'll show you some pictures of my firings later and we'll talk about that. But I use wood, I use like mesquite wood or things like that. And the trouble with wood is as it burns, those pieces of wood start falling away from the pottery. So the, you, with the manure, they kind of build a little, a little oven out of it and it just stays together, which is nice. Um, and I have a problem with firing with manure. The problem, the reason I don't fire with manure, believe me, there's lots of manure in Arizona, uh, is uh, I'm trying to recreate prehistoric pottery. And in prehistoric times, they didn't have cattle here. They didn't have buffalo this far west, uh, west of like um, the Rio Grande. So they're more on the plains. They're farther east. Um, so the only, I mean, the largest animals we have are like deer and elk. And, and you know, their manure is pretty small. Be hard to fire a pot with it. And so what I'm going to talk about today a lot is kind of how uh, we try to figure out maybe how they fired pottery prehistorically before they had manure. So when the Spanish came in, what? 1600s I think um, you know they brought livestock with them and they introduced uh, sheep and cattle and, and that made a big difference in Pueblo culture Pueblo culture was all you know turned upside down by these Spanish and the Spanish didn't you know do a lot of documentation about uh, the native culture like how they fired pottery they didn't write down how they fired pottery you know before manure so um, we're left with very very few clues because by the time the first anthropologists or ethnologists arrived you know in the 1800s and started taking notes about how pottery was fired well they had long ago you know maybe hundreds of years previously changed to manure and so we're left kind of making a guessing game and doing some archaeology and I'll talk about that as we go on okay Johnny Appleseed poo yes uh, that is exactly right uh, let's see where am I at here uh, I'll go to the next picture And this is, um, this is the great um, Hopi Tewa artist Nampeo, I believe, firing pottery. Again, uh, different Pueblos do different things. So um, like some of the New Mexico Pueblos prefer cow manure. Over in uh, Hopi, they like sheep manure. And so they get it out of the pens where the sheep have been um, pooing and trampling it down. And so it comes in thick mats and then cut it up into blocks and stack it up. And you can see uh, behind, she's bent over there probably, you know, putting some fuel on the fire or stacking pottery. Uh, it's a, it's a, a position I know well. But you can see behind her, there are some pots kind of stacked up. Okay, so uh, let's move on to the next one I have. Uh, this, uh, this is another, um, you know, historic Pueblo manure firing. Uh, and there's quite a few of these, but I think those old historic pictures are real interesting because uh, they kind of give us a glimpse of how things were done before uh, modern technology. Uh, and, and, you know, in a lot of cases, uh, these people are still firing in the same manner. Um, but at least then, you know, this shows us that they're still firing, that there's a long tradition of that, if we can look back and see they're still doing it. Still, a lot of Pueblos today do kiln fire, uh, like where my friend Bobby lives at Zuni, uh, lots and lots of the potters there kiln fire and over at Acoma it's the same way I don't I was at Acoma a few years ago and uh, I couldn't find any pottery that was outdoor fired I'm sure somebody's doing it but it's very rare there these days but if you go to Hopi then almost everybody fires outdoors so uh, it depends on where you're at uh, and I think this is a, a Hopi guy uh, so a lot is always made of like um, pottery is a is a woman's art you know um, but that's not always true. See, this this man is, uh, maybe he didn't make the pottery, you know, but he's helping with the firing. Um, over, you know, in San Ildefonso Pueblo, Maria Martinez is famous for her pottery, but um, her husband did a lot of the painting on a lot of her more famous pots. Uh, her early stuff was all painted by her husband, and then her son did a lot of it uh, later in life. So um, men always had a hand in the pottery, even though they were maybe not the potters themselves. Uh, and this is another uh, manure fire, and he's uh, he's probably just waiting for it to cool down enough to take the pots out or something. 
and I think this is the last of the historic pictures that I have. Uh, and I think this one was labeled as Santa Clara Pueblo. And uh, I, I think it's interesting, and, and you'll see this if you visit the Pueblos today, is that she's got her manure stacked up over there, and she's got like stuff over the top, tarps and maybe some boards or something to kind of keep the rain off of it. So uh, sometimes, you know, they value that manure because it's, it's important to their, to their art and their income. So uh, they'll buy truckloads of manure. They'll pay lots and lots of money for, for manure up there. And then, uh, you know, they'll kind of cherish it and they'll put it up, you know, under the porch or someplace where it can stay dry and take good care of it. So you've never seen anybody uh, value manure like they do up there, some of those potters. <laughs> uh, and so let's go back in time a little bit now and talk about uh, what we know about how pottery was fired in prehistoric times. So um, if you go up to the Four Corners area, so those of you that aren't in the United States, uh, the area we call Four Corners is where uh, the states of Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico all come together in a big square. The only place in the country where four states touch. Uh, and so that area is called the Four Corners, and that's kind of around the center of, of what we call Anazazi or Ancestral Puebloan uh, culture back, say, if you go back to 1100 AD, that, that was really the, the center of it. Um, and now today, if you go to the Pueblos, they're farther east at, um, you know, along the Rio Grande, or they're farther west out in Hopi, but back in those days, it was right there around those Four Corners. Uh, so if you go up there, if you've ever been to like Mesa Verde National Park or Chaco Canyon, there's some, there's some really famous ruins up in that area. And, uh, and they find what they call a trench kilns up there. So if you look at the picture on the screen here, this was given to me my, by my friend Wayne Keene, and this is uh, an ancient trench kiln. So you can see those slabs, they would use rock slabs and kind of outline, they dig a hole, a trench, like a rectangular hole in the ground, and outline it with slabs and they would fire in that. So um, archaeologists have been finding these for a long time, but um, nobody knew you know, initially exactly how that pottery was fired in there. And so it, this pottery was painted with organic paint. Uh, so it was just, um, it was like syrup. It was like plant, plant material that was boiled down. And generally, if you paint on a pot with you know, plant material, what's it going to do in the fire? It's going to burn off, right? It's going to give you nothing but ash. So somehow they were doing this and, and somebody had to figure out how to do it and so it took a lot of experimentation uh, i'll go to the next picture which will show you another trench kiln uh, i think these are up in um southeast or south yeah southeast utah uh s-t-r-r -R? is it saint railroad saint rr -R? hi andy carrie from texas if the slip rubs off after firing did it not get hot enough for to vitrify um yeah, probably. So different slips uh, have different temperatures at which they mature. Well, different clays. All clays have different temperatures at which they mature, you know. And so some clays might mature at 700 degrees. Other clays might not mature until 800 degrees. Uh, this is Celsius. And so I've run into this a lot. So uh, my clays, my brown clays from down here in southern Arizona, they have a lot of fluxes in them. They have a lot of mineral content that helps them uh, harden, not vitrify, because vitrify means it's starting to melt. And, and my pottery is all fairly low fired. It's not vitrified at all, but it is ceramic. It's earthenware. Um, so um, my, my potteries down here will, will harden. They'll turn into ceramic at like 650, right? But a lot of the pottery, especially our clay, white, especially the white clay from up in northern Arizona, the Four Corners area, you know, north a couple hundred miles north of here uh, some of that stuff doesn't harden until you know 750 800 degrees and so uh, i would go up there and collect some of that um clay from up there and i would use it for a slip like you're talking about carrie right i'd slip my pottery with it and um and it'd look really good come out of the fire and everything right until you put it under a a a, 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 a I say it. you put it in the sink to, to wash it because when you pull it out of the fire it's covered with char and ash and you start scrubbing on it and the slip starts coming off in chunks right but the bottom the base clay the clay underneath the slip is hard as can be so you've got a difference in the temperature at which and if you fire right in that in that window between the two then the the slip will come off and the pot will stay and i've i've had that experience a number of times so it's not it's not unusual 
you're going to have to figure out what temperature you need to reach to get your slip to, uh, to harden, Carrie. Some places in India use dried manure to cook food. Well, sure. I, I, last year, I traveled the Oregon Trail. So um, in, you know, in the United States back in the 1800s, say 1840 to, to um, you know, 1890, when people were emigrating west, uh, the Oregon Trail was a main route that they would take uh, wagons. And they'd travel for, you know, 1,000, 1,500 miles across the Great Plains. And, um, and there's no trees out on the Great Plains. They would cook all their meals with uh, buffalo chips out there. So it's not, un it's not unheard of to use manure to cook food for sure. Uh, it has a funny smell, and I could see it, you know, putting that smell in the in the food. But it doesn't smell like manure. It just smells like, you know, burning manure. You know how every wood has its own smell. Um, what is the age of these trench kilns? Um, uh, they're probably like whenever Mesa Verde was inhabited. So uh, let's say uh, from about let's say 700 A.D. to about uh, 1150, right? Maybe 1,200, something like that, uh, that trench kilns were used. Or that area was inhabited by people that were firing pottery in trench kilns. I'll say that. Uh, verify. That's what happened. Yeah. Um, Chris in Kansas. Hey, Chris. Some central Kansas red slipped was apparently fugitive, and it was applied after the first firing, then fired again. Yeah, um, well, that was twice fired. Some of the early red wear that was made in the southwest, um, Mogi, I think it was called San... San Francisco Red, and not, not named after the city in California, but there's a San Francisco River over on the Arizona-New Mexico border. Um, and it was it was painted with a fugitive red, uh, I don't even think it was a slip because it was like iron oxide, basically a ground up stone or something. And it was put on after the pot was fired. So they'd fire the pot, and then they'd rub this red on it and kind of redify it, but you know, you could clean it, you could wipe it off. And, and even when you, you know, dig it up, 700 years later, it's still coming off. So, not unusual, I guess. Uh, they just they just wanted it to be pretty. Uh, okay, so so they're making these these the archaeologists are digging up these these trench kilns, but they don't they don't know how they were fired. Uh, let me move on. Now, um, this is a picture from the Southwest Kiln Conference, which is happening the end of September in Blanding, Utah, and that's where uh, a lot of people that replicate, you know, reproduce ancient pottery types, kind of get together, share ideas, fire pottery together. So uh, there's a lot of people that fire in these trench kilns up there. So over the years, you know, people working on trying to understand how this pottery was fired, figured out how to keep that organic paint from burning away by firing in a trench kiln. So I'm going to show you how they fire these trench kilns today. So this is a trench kiln at the kiln conference. That's a pile of pottery, but that's probably multiple people's pottery, right? Not just one person, but people come to the conference, they always bring a few pots to fire, and then they all put them together and fire a big trench kiln together. So in this scene, uh, they've built up a bed of coals in the bottom. You can see in the bottom there's, there's coals. They're probably two, three, four inches thick. There's a lot of coals in there. And then they use these little slabs of sandstone to kind of um, set on top of the coals and then prop the pottery on those pieces of sandstone above the coals because every place the pot touches the fuel that is the coals or whatever it may leave a black mark on the pot so by propping them up on sandstone you're keeping that pottery clean in the firing it won't come out with black spots all right so this is um this is how they start I'll show you the next step okay once they get that trench kiln all filled with their pottery then they they put over the top what they call cover sherds these are just broken bits of pottery um, well, in prehistoric times, there were broken bits of pottery. Nowadays, because most of this pottery is not used for practical purposes like cooking or storing things in, but it's decorative. Therefore, it, you know, you don't break that much of it. Most of these potters make cover shirts. So they just roll out slabs of clay and fire them to use for cover shirts. So in this case, remember that that pottery was sitting on top of sandstone above the coals. That kept the fuel from touching the pottery. The cover sherds on top do the same thing. They keep the fuel that's going to be stacked there from touching the pottery. And then as the fuel, imagine you're stacking wood over this. As that fuel burns, those bits of coals are going to fall down on the pots. And you don't want that. Uh, it, that, that can do two things. Uh, it can cause black spots on the pots every place a, a coal touches it. But also, in between these pots, there's air space. And that circulation of hot air is critical for a good, clean, and hot firing. And so 
The cover shirts also keep those voids, those spaces between the pots, from filling up with coals. Okay? I'll move on to the next picture if I can here. Okay, so here they are putting what they call spanners across. So spanners are where they, they'll cut these big, long uh, pieces of wood uh, that can span the trench in both directions. See how they've got some going across this way and some going across this way. So they're making kind of a framework, a lattice of wood over the top of this kiln. And then they're going to start stacking firewood on top of it. Uh, the amount of wood they use to fire one of these trench kills is unbelievable. It's like, you know, half a cord of wood. I have never, by the way, I have never fired this way. I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying um, I'm, I live in southern Arizona. The types of pottery I recreate are different, and therefore I don't fire this way. Um, I'm just showing you how up in the Four Corners area um, pots were fired. I'll get to, to my firing in a little bit. Okay, so once you've got all the wood stacked, you light this thing on fire and it gets hot. You can't even, you see all those people are standing back there? You don't even want to get stand close to this thing. It's, it's a hot fire. Um, yeah. It's inefficient though, uh, because in a, in a kiln, you're usually putting that fuel in such a place that the heat will pass over the pottery uh, or the heat's being held in by the walls of the kiln. And in this case, most of that heat is rising through convection and going up into the atmosphere. The pottery is under it, and so um, very inefficient use of fuel. And it, you know, like I said, it uses a lot of fuel. So once it burns to coals, once it gets to it, and and I understand from talking to people that fire this way that um, the timing is critical. The timing of when you smother it, when it gets to a certain point, when it's burned to coals, and and I'm unaware of how you know when the point is. Uh, when it gets to a certain point, then they get in there with shovels and they cover the whole thing with dirt. They tamp it all down so that no oxygen can get in there and no smoke is escaping. It's completely encased in earth. And then they just leave it sit there for hours and hours and hours. Uh, usually this is done in the afternoon and they don't open it up until the next morning. So that way that pottery has a chance to cool with no oxygen so it doesn't burn that organic paint out of the pots. Hey Wes, uh, what kind of temperature do they achieve? Um, I think, Wes, that it's in Clint's book, uh, but I, like I said, I don't fire this way. From my understanding, the temperature is in the less than 900 C, so it's, you know, it's 850 or, or maybe nine at the top end, so it's not that much hotter than my average firings. Um, but like I said, just try to picture, okay, here's here's a pot, right? I'm firing on the ground. So the pot's sitting here, the wood is right here. Okay, they're firing, the pot is under the ground, and the wood is up here. I think, I think even less of that heat, it takes more heat to effect, efficiently fire this pot in a, in a trench than it does on the surface, right? Certainly the fire is built above the trench because uh, abundance of oxygen. If you built the fire down in the trench, you'd have trouble getting a, a good hot fire because there wouldn't be that much oxygen available. Let's see. And, and some of this is speculation on my part because like I said, I've never fired this way. So here they are the next morning uh, and they, they carefully pull that soil back and they start fishing those pots out and reaching around and reaching around in their hands, kind of grubbing around in that, all that ash and coals and pulling out pots. Uh, and it, it works. I, I can't say it doesn't work. It's, it, uh, it makes some beautiful pottery. It's just, uh, like I said, it uses a lot of wood. Uh, and that's, uh, that's how they do it up north. That's how they recreate ancient ancestral Puebloan pottery. Now, they find trench kilns up there. Like I said, the archaeologists find them everywhere. But as you move south, even as you get down into um, northern parts of northern Arizona, like up in the little Colorado River Valley, you don't find trench kiln. It's not trench kiln country. Now, they were firing pottery, and they were reducing pottery because a lot of that Cibola whiteware that was made in the little Colorado area, so if you look at a map, like um, I'm talking about like Holbrook and um, uh, what's that? Sanders and St. John's, uh, you know, not super far north, south of the Navajo Reservation, south of I-40. Um, a lot of whiteware was made in those days. 
but that was mostly reduced iron making that black. So they were getting iron, they were painting it with red iron paint and then getting it really hot and getting it to turn black and then probably smothering it or somehow keeping that iron from, from oxidizing. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, so, uh, and they don't have, my point is they were reducing iron, they were smothering somehow down there, but they were not using trench kilns because they don't find them in the archeological records. So there's still a lot of question marks as to how people fired uh, back in the day. Uh, Wes says, what do you know at point, do you know at what point the organic paint burns off? Yeah, that organic paint, oh, it'll burn off at a very low temperature. Um, uh, so Patricia Crown in her book um, about Salado Polychrome, uh, what's it called? Ideology something. Anyway, uh, Patricia Crown's book about Salado Polychrome, she says that organic paint burns off, starts to burn off above 700 degrees uh, Celsius. So it, it burns off fairly low temp. Um, but I, part of that is uh, the atmosphere, right? So a firing uh, on the way up, when, the, when all that wood is burning, right? Here, let me show you. So at this point, when all that wood is combusting, actively burning, um, that pottery does not have access to very much oxygen because the wood is consuming all of it. The atmosphere around that pottery is high in carbon, low in oxygen. It is a, what you would call a reducing atmosphere. It's, um, it's, it's smoky, right? Um, and there's not much oxygen getting to the pottery. So even though it may be above, let's say, let's say um, organic paint burns off at 700, right? Just for a round number. Even though the temperature may be well above 700, let's say it's 850 in there, right? Um, there's no oxygen. So you can't burn it off without oxygen. It's as it starts cooling and getting into, so once it, once it stops actively combusting like that, and you start going to coals, then that op, the oxygen level rises quickly. Uh, and that's when you start, that's when you start burning off your paint. And so the key is to burn off any carbon that's on the outside of the pot, because it'll, it'll get carbon right out of the atmosphere even. Uh, and, and not burn off the paint. There's a narrow window there and they're shooting for it in these trench kilns and I'm shooting for it on my surface firings, but we're doing it in a different way. I'll get to that in a second, okay? So down south, let's, you know, Arizona, southern Arizona, Phoenix, Tucson, right? Uh, all the way down to the border, at east into New Mexico, like members country, all over by Silver City and all the way across to like Las Cruces, El Paso. Um, they don't find trench kilns either. Uh, and unlike up in the Four Corners area where they find um, archeological evidence of how pottery is fired, right? The archeologists have literally identified hundreds and hundreds of trench kilns. We don't have any evidence of, of firings at all. There's only one place where they have for sure evidence of this is where they were firing pottery in prehistoric times. The rest is all guesswork. So. In some ways, the best way for us to learn about how they were firing pottery in prehistoric times is to look at how their descendants are firing pottery in historic or modern times. So although the Pueblos fire with manure, uh, the native people down here uh, usually fire with wood, with mesquite wood. So I'm gonna talk about specifically here uh, the O'odham potters. This is, um, a guy named Rupert Angia who lived in a place called Hikiwan, which is uh, between, I'm in Tucson here, so maybe maybe 70 miles uh, west of here, okay, out in the desert there on the reservation. Um, and, and his family makes beautiful polychrome pottery, multiple colors. And uh, this is a picture of one of his firings. And so here you see a shallow pit, very shallow pit, right? So it's maybe six or eight inches deep. It's not a foot deep. Uh, and mesquite wood piled in a teepee form. This, these pictures were taken, I think, in the 80s. Uh, and so here we see he burned the fire. He put the, he put the pots in a wash tub, in an old galvanized wash tub. So here's after the fire's burned and he's, he's got that wash tub hooked with you know, a piece of metal or something. He's dragging it out uh, in order to retrieve the pottery from the hot coals. 
So the wash tub would have been something like we find cover shirts. Remember we talked about cover shirts? So if you want to separate the, the fuel from the pottery, in ancient times, they would have used pieces of broken pottery. Uh, today, you know, some of us use cover shirts. Uh, in modern times, a lot of natives use metal pans, uh, uh, cafeteria trays, license plates, bits of sheet metal, anything to kind of keep the fuel off of the pot. So in this case, he's used a galvanized tub. And here he is opening up. So he's got a piece of bent up metal on top of the tub and he pulls the piece of metal off and there's those pots inside. They're just beautiful and pristine. Not a blemish on them because they got fired nice and hot in that mesquite wood and they were protected by the uh, wash tub. And I used to think you had to put holes in the wash tub. So if you ever watch one of my videos where I'm using a, a wash tub, I do have some I've used. Um, you'll see that I've, I put holes in them, but a lot of these natives use wash tubs. They don't have any holes in them. So that's not important. I thought they had to, you know, you had to vent that smoke out of there. But uh, like uh, Ron Carlos, for example, and you can see there's a video on YouTube about Ron Carlos, a friend of mine, um, Salt River Reservation. He doesn't have holes in his wash tub. Um, Chris in Kansas, I've wondered if animal fat might have been a supplemental firing fuel, although likely reserved for nutritional needs. King John felled part of Rochester Castle with gobs of pig fat. Well, Chris, that would only be a usable thing out on the plains where you have buffalo. Fat would have been a precious commodity here where I live because we didn't have buffalo. I mean, elk and deer are very, very lean. Uh, there would have been very little fat uh, that would have been used. But perhaps out on the plains, I don't know how much, how much fat you're able to harvest from a buffalo. You would have a better idea of that than I would. In what form would you f use it as fuel? Because I would think if you just sat it on the ground, as soon as it got hot, it would liquefy and run into the ground, right? Would you need to put it in a receptacle? Maybe something we should talk about at another time. Uh, okay, so here they are uh, pulling the pots out of the fire. And here's another picture of a different old Odom firing. So this is a, a woman, I'm sorry, I don't know her name. Uh, she was over by, um, over in the cells area. Cell is, is the, um, uh, what do they call it, a capital seat? I don't know, the, the headquarters of the, Tohono O'odham tribe here west of Tucson. And she's firing in a very similar way to the pictures we saw Rupert Angia firing. Shallow pit, like I said, maybe six, eight inches. It's not it's not super deep. Uh, shallow pit and teepee-like arrangement and a few cover shirts. Well, I think hers are bits of metal again, but something to kind of, not a, not a wash basin, but something to kind of keep the fuel from falling on her pottery and giving blemishes. So. In that way, if we look at the way they're firing there, we can say, well, perhaps, you know, these prehistoric people in this area, oh, excuse me, were firing in a similar way, uh, you know, because these are their, these are their descendants. So here is the only example in the archaeological record of a prehistoric firing in the southern southwest. This is Snake Town. They found an actual pottery producing kind of area, like a, like a workshop, right? It had, um, it had tools for making pottery, it had lumps of um, processed clay, uh, and it had these firing areas. So this is a shallow pit full of sherds because they were using cover sherds uh, and charcoal and ash. And, and it's, it seems pretty obvious, especially that it was uh, in the same proximity as these lumps of clay and places for kneading clay, the whole the whole shebang, it was a pottery workshop area in Snake Town, which is the biggest Holocom site in prehistoric times. Uh, and it's just uh, south of Tucson on the Gila. Uh, no, south of Phoenix on the Gila, sorry. Yeah, so um, there's a few other places where archeologists have found things that they say, oh, this might be a kiln. But if you look at the evidence, it's not really conclusive the way the Snake Town ones are. Uh, okay, Chris, uh, Wes has to go. Uh, watch the recording later. See you, Wes. Thanks for coming. Uh, see where we're at here. So, given the fact that there's no archaeological evidence for how pottery is fired, and that the natives fire on top or in the ground or in shallow pits with a teepee-like arrangement, this is the way I. Fi this is my usual firing routine. There are different ways I fire depending on what I'm trying to make, and I'll show you that in a little bit because I've got some pots here to talk about. <clears throat> So 
This is just your standard run of the mill. Um, I'm gonna fire some pottery, pottery firing, okay? Uh, this is um, what I call preheating. So um, pottery has moisture in it when you make it. And you can set that pot on a shelf after you've made it and let it sit for six months or a year and it could still have moisture inside there. You can even pick up moisture from the atmosphere. So it's always a good idea to preheat your pottery. Get it up, excuse me. I got burps, I don't know why I'm drinking iced tea. Um, get it up hot enough that it drives off the rest of that moisture out of the clay. Uh, some people, you can do this right in your kitchen oven. If you're firing in town or something, uh, you can just stick it in your oven, turn the oven on low, and leave it there for, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour. It, it's not a big deal. Just get it hot and get that moisture out of there. In this case, um, I'm doing two things, all right? I, I have a little fire. I'm burning it. Remember the pottery in the trench kiln how it was stacked over hot coals? I do the same thing. My pottery stacks the same way the native peoples do. The Oodon potters we talked about, they started with a bed of coals. I'm building a bed of coals that they'll then stack the pottery above. And while I'm building that bed of coals, I, I move the pottery around the fire and then I rotate it. So I, I preheat it on this side, I preheat it on that side, I preheat the bottom, I preheat the rim, make sure it's all preheated. Otherwise, when it gets hot, you'll get spalls as that moisture tries to escape the pot. So um, That's what's going on here. Uh, now, after you're done um, preheating the pottery, uh, you're going to stack the pottery on rocks above the coal. So very similar to what they were doing up in the Four Corners area. The, the rocks keep the pottery from touching those coals, which can cause black spots, blemishes on your pottery. So um, a lot of times I preheat those rocks the same way I do the pottery because I want to make sure there's no moisture in the, in the rocks. Now, in Arizona, a lot of times everything's just dry as can be, and you don't, you know, you don't worry about it too much if it hasn't rained in three months, right? Um, but like right now, this is this picture was taken maybe a month ago. Uh, it's been raining a lot because we're in our monsoon season, and so all the rocks, especially ones in a creek like that, have a potential to have moisture inside of them, and you don't want that rock exploding in your firing. So I'll stick them around the fire and, and preheat those stones as well as the pottery, and then. I stack the stones on top of the coals and then the pottery carefully on top of the rocks. And that's what I'm doing in this picture, arranging it in such a way that we keep those air spaces. Like I said, airflow is very important to the firing. So I want to maintain those air spaces. If you stack the pottery too close together, uh, air won't circulate and you'll have a lot of black kind of sooty areas. So you want that air to circulate. And that has to do with the ways that, uh, well, I used to work for the Forest Service as a firefighter, and so they learned. They taught us a lot about um, what do they call it? Um, um, fire science. And so there's three methods of heat transfer. Way heat can move from one place to another. There's convection, conduction, and radiation. Radiation is radiant heat. So like if you put your hand up and you can feel like a campfire, you can feel the heat on your hand, or like the warmth you feel from the sun. That's radiant heat. Conduction is like if I stick the spoon in my pot of beans and I leave it there and then I come and I grab the spoon and the handle is hot that's conduction right it traveled through a solid surface through a solid material up the handle uh, and then a convection is hot air moving around and so most of the um, you think about it most of the heating of the pottery in a fire is from convection it's from hot air moving around and so keeping those air spaces in your firing is very important that hot air has to move around. That's how that heat is being transferred from the fire to the pots. So when you're stacking, uh, you need to keep that in mind and stack in such a way that you're maintaining those air spaces around the pottery. Ren Pixie, hey, you're late, but you made it. All right, uh, where's my next picture here? Uh, so then, uh, similar to what we saw from the Oodom firings, um, once I have the pottery stacked, then I will stack the wood in a teepee fashion around it and light it off and let it burn. And once you do that, there's not a lot you can do to, you know, control the temperature or to control the atmosphere. You pretty much just let it go until it burns to coals. Now, I will, main, I will sometimes try to keep an eye on what the temperature is like. And I do that with a couple of different tools. And then if I'm if I'm not hot enough and it starts burning to coals, I will add more fuel. I had to do that last week when I fired. So 
it started burning the coals. I hit it with my um my infrared gun, and I was my hot hot top temperature was like 750, and I I needed to get over 800. So I basically went. I had more fuel set aside. I took the fuel. I started stacking around it, and I kind of bumped that temperature up and, and got it where I wanted it. Do I use shards? Says peas and butter. I uh, cover shirt. What they call cover shards. So pieces of broken pottery stacked around my uh, pottery, usually, but not always, peas and butter. So, um, like I said, you need to maintain that airspace. And so cover shards are used a lot by me. To, like if I have three pots, right? And then there's a, you know, there's a hole where, between the pots. And I don't want that hole getting filled up with coals. So I'll use a cover shirt strategically placed uh, to keep the coals from falling down in that hole. So yeah, I do. I have a whole crate full of cover shirts out there that I use for that. I need to make some more. I'm, I'm out of big ones. So if I fire a big pot, I either stick it out there without cover shirts or I use like a galvanized tub. So I need to make some more. And basically, I just roll out slabs. I drape them over something so they have a little bit of a curvature to them because they work better that way. And then um, I fire them. So I'm, I'm in the need for getting more. So I'll show you how I measure. Oh, oh, stuff's flying everywhere. I'll show you how I measure temperature. Uh, this is my uh, thermocouple and pyrometer. So this works okay. You can bury this under the dirt. This is a nice long, like a 12-inch probe. So I can bury this under the ground, you know, and then stick that tip right up next to the pottery in the firing, right? So it might go through the bed of coals, past the stones, and right up by the pot. Meanwhile, this end is underground. That way, you know, it doesn't melt the wire because it will. You can see it's it's kind of black and gross. But it works good. And it's completely analog. There's no batteries or anything. So I never get out in the field and go, oh, no, you know, I, I forgot to put batteries in this thing. It's, and it's, it's pretty, it takes a beating. I can just stick this in the dirt. I don't worry about it. Um, it works good. So that's one way that I measure temperature. And then um, the other way is, I've got this little um, infrared gun, which works pretty good. I've got a video comparing the two uh, methods of measuring temp, if you're interested in that. Um, but this works real good because like with the with the thermocouple, sometimes I'll forget to, because I've got to plan ahead before I stack the fuel and kind of put the probe in the ground and run the wire under the dirt and, t you know, and then set the little um, pyrometer someplace where, away from the flames. And sometimes I forget to do that because there's a lot of things to think about when you're doing a firing. There's the temperature and there's the fuel and there's the weather and you're thinking about the pottery and, you know, you have a lot of things on your mind. And so it's easy to forget something and go, oh, geez, I forgot to put the... Uh, the thermocouple in. And with this, if I forget, I can still get a measurement. I just, as long as I can get those little red dots on the pottery, then I can get a measurement, which is nice. Um, and then the other thing I brought to show you was my, my welding gloves. Now these, I probably need some new ones. They're starting to wear out. But welding gloves are really useful because, you know, you're reaching in there and <laughs> grabbing hot things. So uh, it's good to have something to grab them with without burning your hands. Even for preheating, I use the welding gloves. Uh, so <clears throat> so now, you know, it's, it's burning and you're just letting it burn. Like I said, if it, if it starts to cool down and hasn't reached where I want to reach, and that, like I said, like we talked about, was it, who was it that was talking about their, um, their slip knot hardening? Um, hmm. S-T-R-R. I'm going to call you St. Railroad, but I don't know if that's what it means. Uh, like St. Railroad said, you know, her slip wasn't getting hard on the pottery. And, um, you know, you might know because you had experience with your clays. Uh, with this clay, I've got to get it up to 800 or it's not going to be hard enough or that kind of thing. Um, you know, and, and so you hit that pot or you want to oxidize um, this, you know, yellow slip or you want to turn your red slip black. You've got to get it up there like 850 or something then if it doesn't get there, then you can throw more fuel on it. But there's there's not a lot else you can do. Uh, I mean, basically, once you light it, it just it goes, right? TJ said, I would love to do something like an outdoor firing, but I rent, and I'd have to ask my landlady if, I was, if it was okay. Plus, our little parking lot is passed by lots of people and not a good neighborhood. Yeah, sometimes you just got to get, you know, out in the country or to a vacant lot or something. You know, TJ, you can come to the Kiln Conference in September and fire with me. All right, let's look at the next step here. 
if I can get it to work. So here's that same fire. Uh, it had that big old Oya in it that I made. And the fuel's burning down. At this point, it's just cooling. Um, you know, so that's, that's kind of another step, is trying to let it cool slowly so you don't give it thermal shock. And in some cases, you know, like when it's a big jar like this, this is what I was talking about with the with the manure. Manure forms a little oven over your pot, and it keeps its shape as it burns. It just turns into little ash pieces, but they kind of stay together. And so it'll keep that heat in there better, give you a better soak, and it won't, you know, cool it off as quickly. Whereas with wood, you've got this problem where as the wood burns, it just wants to fall away and, uh, and just expose your pot. So you better hope you have enough temper that you're not going to thermal shock it as this starts happening. TJ, I wish I could. I'm a university student up in Canada. I'm taking a ceramics class, though. I've been making pottery all summer. Cool. Uh, maybe another time, TJ. Uh, you certainly have a lot of open country in Canada. You know, I, I, I bet you could find a, a little bit of land where you could fire. Anyway, uh, so, you know, you're cooling off at this point. Your coals are coming away. And this is the, this is the point where if you didn't reach a high enough temperature you could always throw more wood on it you don't have to like start over or anything just stack more wood around it that's what I did last week on my firing I did it twice last week um, I did three firings one for organic paint uh, one for just a regular firing and then one that I wanted to reduce iron paint and I'll get to that and um, so for the last two I wanted to get over 800 and so I had to basically you know put fuel on it twice oh we're getting up in time. I got to keep moving along here. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I'm going to show you about my firing last week. Um, so here's my ladle. Uh, the ladle video comes out next Wednesday. So if you're interested in uh, the ladle, uh, make sure you check that out on Wednesday. Uh, so I made the ladle and I painted it. Well, I'll tell you what. I have a problem with manganese paint. So a lot of my black paints uh, that you see on pots I've made, like, like this one here, right it makes a really nice black this is manganese this is a, a mineral that I collect over in New Mexico um, and it makes the, it makes a gorgeous black right but it's toxic so I don't want to eat it so here it is on a mug that I can't drink out of because I don't want to put my mouth on that manganese right and so when I made the ladle I thought it'd be nice if I could use this ladle I don't want to paint it with manganese because then I can't use it for food right so I thought, well, I'm going to try reducing iron. So Mimbris pottery, which is made over in um, southern New Mexico, and a lot of the uh, ancestral Puebloan pottery, like up in the little Colorado area, like I was talking about earlier, they use reduced iron paint. So somehow they're getting, they're painting it with red iron oxide. They're getting it hot enough that that red iron turns black, and then they're keeping it from oxidizing through some sort of smothering action, keeping the oxygen away. And so I was interested in how, tr trying to achieve that. Uh, and so I painted it with red iron oxide thinking, I'm going to try to reduce to black, but if I don't, it's not that big of a deal. Red on white is still beautiful, right? So that was my thought when I painted it with red. Uh, Clash Cornholio. Well, if there are parks with public barbecue spots. Yeah, absolutely. That's true. You, if there was a park where you could build a, a campfire or if they have like barbecue pits, you could do that totally. Gremlin Hunter, is it possible to fire small pieces of pottery in a gas fireplace? Living in one of the counties in the country with the strictest fire rules has got me thinking outside the box. Uh, definitely somebody on my YouTube, I can't remember the name of the channel now, but somebody who was following me, my YouTube channel, was firing in a fireplace recently, and they did a video on it. Um, um, Suburban Stone Age, maybe. Try that one. Uh, Bobby says, this guy can fire in a barbecue grill. That's how I did one time in the city. Well, there you go. Uh, you know, I know people that fire in, in chimeneas. I know people that fire in, like, barbecue. I know people that fire in fireplaces. So, you know, get uh, get creative. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, uh, so so here's my my um, my ladle firing. So it's it's painted with red paint. Here I go ahead and I um, and I stick it on the coals. Now I've already fired twice here. Remember I said I fired three times. This is the last firing of the day. And the reason I did it last was I wanted a lot of really hot coals underneath of it to because I wanted to get that temperature up as the best I could. So this is the third firing. There's a ton of coals and I'm and I'm sitting it on rocks. Here I am sitting on rocks over these very hot coals. Now 
I'm using a cover shirt to cover it up. And that is because I'm going to smother it in a little bit, and I don't want that earth, I don't want the dirt touching it. Because dirt is full of organic material. Even the dirt itself has bits of organic material in it. From You know, it's dirt. It's got decomposed plants and things in it, right? So it will, it will carbonize the pottery when it touches it. Um, so I didn't want the dirt touching it, but I do want to smother it. So in this case, um, if you saw my video two weeks back where I was remaking Michael Holly's Pookie, that big Pookie I made, I'm that that <coughs> I'm dying here. That big Pookie is is what I'm placing over the ladle in this picture. That you acted as my cover shirt. Now it's on it was unfired. I was firing it as well, but I was using it as a cover shirt while I was firing it. Killing two birds with one stone. Okay. Let me show you the next picture. <coughs> so, once I had that set up, I just stacked the wood over it in teepee fashion, just like I would otherwise. And like I said, I fired it twice. So I let this burn. Uh, I was 750-ish. And it was starting to burn to coals. I put more fuel on it. And I got clear up to 850, uh, according to my little... Uh, infrared gun so that I knew from previous experience when I had turned red iron paint black on accident that 850 would do it so that's what that was what I was aiming for and I couldn't see remember it's underneath that big pookie so I couldn't look at the ladle and say oh look it's black now I couldn't I had to guess based on previous experience firing red paint and having it turn black so in the past I've made let's say I'm making red on brown right and I get it in a hot, hot fire. And I pull the pot out while it's still hot. And all my red is turned black. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, my, my red turned black. What's going on? But but iron oxidizes on the back end of the firing as the pots are cooling. So between, let's say we get up to 850, right? As it's cooling, the iron doesn't start oxidizing until you're below like 500 degrees Celsius. So between like 850, no. Between 250 and 5 is where the iron turns red. So as it cools, that black turns kind of a dark red, maroon, and then slowly gets brighter and brighter as it cools. So um, I knew I could turn it black. The, the key was keeping it black, keeping it from turning red as it cooled. So let me show you the next picture. So here it is, you know, in full combustion, burning up, getting nice and hot. And remember, my ladle and my pookie are under there. All right. So uh, once it was hot, um, I kind of pulled any of the fuel that was still actively combusting away because I didn't want that trapped inside with the pottery, and then I covered it all with dirt. And I'm trying to transition the picture here. <clears throat> so I left it covered for a long time, like an hour and a half or so. And, and I couldn't sit out there all day because I was out in the desert and it was broiling on. It was like over 100 degrees. And so I thought, oh, I got to get home. I can't sit here and wait. And so <clears throat> I kept, I kind of cleared off the dirt on top of that pookie so I could hit with my infrared gun right on top of the pookie and see how hot that was. And it was like 350 and it was like 290 and I'm waiting for it to get down to like 250 where iron stops oxidizing. <clears throat> and it got close and then I just, I said, I, I can't wait all day. So I, I opened it up. I pulled the pookie off. You can see in the picture it's sitting right there on the on the dirt next to it and I'm I'm pulling that ladle out with my gloved hands and it's hot it's it's so hot that that iron starts oxidizing on me it was pitch black when I opened it up it was like midnight black that red paint I showed you earlier um and then I was like waving it around in the air trying to get it to cool off as quickly as possible because I know once it's below like 260 that iron won't oxidize anymore so let's see is that it? Is that the last picture? Yeah, that's the last picture. So, <clears throat> here's here's my ladle. And where are we at time-wise? Nine minutes. Uh, so you can see it, it oxidized a little. It's got a little bit of a, kind of a brownish or maybe a little bit of a purplish hue, but not much. It's really black. It's good and black. Now, it's not perfect. I've got some carbon spots on it and stuff, but... But I really did reduce iron paint in that firing. That's that's that iron paint you saw it painted on. It was red, and uh, and it's black. 
and and that's how you do it. You got to smother that with, and you know, keep the dirt off of it. So using cover shirts. <clears throat> So um, the other way I fire, so so like I said, I did three fires. The other way I fire that's specific is um, with organic paint. So this is one of the pots I fired last week. That's painted with organic paint. And so with those, I want to keep it nice and brief and not very hot. So maybe no hotter than 750. Honestly, uh, perfect in a perfect world, I might not want to get it over about 710, 720. So nice and low that's where this was it was maybe 720 might have been might have been you know high 600s or low 700s um and you see that you know it came out pretty good that's what you need because if you if it gets too hot or if the or if it's hot too long it'll burn that organic paint out because it's just carbon uh, and then the other thing is with that is i used this like a cover shirt so i had a pot i sat this here the coals fell down on the outside and left fire clouds but because it's not a painted surface it actually adds uh some character to it and it made some nice uh decorations so i like that just fine i'll go with that and with the prehistoric stuff of this type it's often the outside the red part is is has fire clouds so that's the way it works this was an experimental one that i did last year at my workshop and this only got up to uh low 700s too really fast this was maybe Maybe a 15 minute firing. I'm not kidding. And I have the video to show it. Um, and I was experimenting with different paints. So, uh, you know, one of them is Rocky Mountain Bee Plant and one of them is Clammy Weed and one is um, Yucca and Mesquite, uh, Mesquite Beans and Yucca Fruit just to see what would make the blackest black. And they all came out real good. So the, the secret with this organic paint is um, abbreviating that oxidation period as much as possible. Just like we saw with the trench kilns that I showed you early on, um, they're smothering to abbreviate that oxidation period. Me, I'm using small fuel and I'm, and I'm breaking the fire apart once it gets to the right temperature to slow down that oxidation. Um, and that's the secret to keeping those organic paints in place. Uh, we're getting close here. Where are we at? Uh, got any comments? Um, Chris in Kansas, is that mesquite? Is it lightweight wood or is it fairly dense? No, mesquite's a very uh, dense wood. It's heavy and it and it burns hot. Mesquite's really good uh, fuel for burning, uh, you know, even in your fireplace or, or your uh, stove or something. It doesn't smoke very much. It doesn't pop. Mesquite's good wood. Uh, M Miguel Paul says, cool, I love Mesa Verde ladles. Yeah, uh, this was... This was um, the first one I made, and it's supposed to rattle. And I definitely put the rattle beads in there, and it won't rattle. So I don't, I'm not sure what went wrong with the rattle. But other than that, it's perfect. Anyways, that that whole video about how I made the ladle is in uh, next Wednesday. That's my video. Um, awesome ladle. Thanks, Miguel. Bobby, thank you. TJ, survived. Yay, no kidding. Uh, and Miguel says, cool, Chaco hatch design on polychrome. Uh, yeah, so, oh, well, this is, um, this is, uh, Pinto Polychrome. Pinto Polychrome. Uh, so where are we at here? Five minutes, guys. You got questions? Uh, that's, that's what I have about firing. So, <clears throat> you know, when I lived in Benson, I worked for myself, uh, doing web design. and I would try to fire every day. I mean, the best advice I can give you if you're trying to learn outdoor firing is do it. Do a lot of it. So I would try to make a new pot every day and then I wouldn't fire it the same day, but I'd, I'd, keep, I'd keep a production, you know, like one pot a day. That way in the morning, I'd get up at like six in the morning, I'd grab my stuff, I'd drive out in the desert. I live right on the edge of town and Benson's a pretty small town. I'd drive out, I'd fire my pot. I'd be back at home in my desk by nine, right? Because these are very brief firings. And just by doing it every day, you get a lot of experience. How, you know, fuel, uh, the amount of fuel to put on it, the amount of time to burn it, you know, the, the right temperature to get, all, you know, wind and moisture and all the different variables you get to play with. So <clears throat> really the best advice I can give you uh, if you're wanting to learn outdoor firing is fire, fire, fire. Make those mistakes because that's how you're going to learn. You're going to make those mistakes and you're going to remember, oh yeah, I remember that time I fired in the snow, you know, that didn't come out so good or whatever. Um, you got to get out there and do it. Great way to learn. Um, 
Does the type of wild clay you find influence how you fire the potter? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I don't have it with me. <clears throat> I did a little, um, I've got a new clay. This was made with that new clay. You can't see it because it slipped, right? So the clay underneath here is not as white as this. It's kind of creamy colored. And it's really nice. It's so nice. It's like, it's like modeling clay. It's super, super plastic, amazing clay. Um, <clears throat> but I wasn't sure how it was going to do in a low temperature firing, right? It comes from up north. And a lot of those northern clays, especially the light colored ones, they need higher temperatures to mature. And so I made a little um, like this, like a Salado polychrome pot to put in the organic paint firing, low temperature, remember, uh, and see how it did. <clears throat> And it was it was kind of brittle. I, it didn't it didn't fire good. I soaked it in water, and then I kind of busted it up, and it just wasn't fired really hard. It was kind of um, it was kind of crummy. Uh, and this is really hard. You can it almost rings. You know, this is really really hard because this was. Excuse me again. Uh, like I said, this was fired up to eight fifty. That other one was fired more in like the seven twenty range, and and it just wasn't hard enough. So. Definitely the type of clay you have influences how you can fire. Absolutely. And, and like I said with, um, oh, I forgot her name again. The Oh, something railroad, street, railroad street, street railroad. I don't know. Uh, and she had a slip that wasn't hardening. So, you know, different clays mature at different temperatures. And you have to know, you know, through experimentation what, what you have and what temperature you're shooting for. Uh, Ren Pixie, were the beads damp when inserted? Um, so I took a clue from Clint Swink's book. If you've ever, Swink, Clint Swink uh, wrote a book about making um, Mesa Verde style pottery. And he said, roll the beads in temper so they're not, you know, sticky. And so that's what I did. I actually had a little bucket of some temper I'd ground up, just ground up pottery shirts. And I took the wet beads and I rolled them around in there. So they were tempered on the outside. So they... They were wet, but they weren't on the outside. They weren't sticky at all. So I don't think the beads stuck. But like I said, it won't rattle. So what can I say? Maybe they did stick. <laughs> Who can say? Uh, Chris in Kansas, good stuff. Thanks, Miguel Paul Pinto Polychrome. Great work. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, very helpful talk, Andy. Thanks, Angela. I'm glad to see you here, uh, Miguel. What is next for your Ancient Pottery Challenge? Oh well, the challenge is done. Uh, the last video for the Ancient Pottery Challenge comes out on Wednesday. And I review everybody's work in that video. So, oh, it looks like my video's having some trouble. Anyways, um, yeah, I review everybody's work in that. I'm done. I still have, you know, I have to redo the OIA because I broke it, but I'm not doing that right away. That took me two weeks of really hard, solid work. So, um, I'll do I'll do it next, you know, sometime next year. I need to come up, who asked that question, Miguel? I need to come up with something fun like that for next season, but not the Ancient Pottery Challenge, so. Uh, I'm open to suggestions if anybody has any ideas for uh, what I could do next season. Season three starts uh, in October. So uh, if somebody's got ideas, I'm thinking about things that are practical, things we can use. So make something and then use it for that thing. Make something that's practical and then show it being used. Make a cooking pot, cook in it. Make a water pot, store water in it. Uh, you know, m make uh, an oil lamp you know, burn uh, a flame on it. You know, do the things that, you know, make a mug, drink out of the mug, you know. That's my idea, but I, it's just a it's just a rough concept in my head right now. So if you have suggestions, uh, shoot them my way in, in the comment section. I would be glad to see that. Oh, everybody hit the like button. I forgot to tell you that. Hit the like button for me. That'll help me um, push this uh, video. Uh, Tammy Earl, what's the shortest time you've taken from making to firing? Could you do it on the same weekend? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I've, I, I've done it in, in two days. Honestly, that, that pot that I just did for the, the city, making primitive pottery in the city, that was, that was like two days. Um, one time at the kiln conference, um, Roger Dorr made a little corrugated pot. About like this. This is the one John made. Made a little corrugated pot and fired it the same day. And then he sold it, too, so... You can. It, it's just a matter of getting it to dry fast enough. Um, if you temper it good enough, you can dry it fast enough without breaking it. Mark Gibson, what part of New Mexico are you going to next? I'm going to Zuni to pick up my friend Bobby Silas, who was on this live stream. Um, this is what I'm doing next week. Okay, I've got a big week coming up. I got, I'm going up to Zuni. I'm going to pick up Bobby. 
Uh, me and Bobby are driving up to Hopi. That's Bobby's Hopi, but he lives at Zuni. Okay. Uh, so we're going to Hopi. We're going to shoot a video about Bobby's pottery and also about, you know, the uh, Sityaki polychrome jetido yellowware that was made in prehistoric times. So we're going to go to some ruins and, and look at where they dug their coal and stuff. They were coal fired pottery. And so that's going to be fun. That's that's next. That's early next week. And then Labor Day weekend, which is uh, what, like the 4th, 5th, 6th, something like that of September. Um, that's my pottery workshop at Kew Ranch. So I go straight from Hopi to Kew Ranch where I will teach uh, a class on pottery. And there's ruins there at Kew Ranch. So I'm going to look at the ruins. We're going to, excuse me, I'm going to look at the ruins. We're going to dig clay. And we're going to make pottery. It's going to be a lot of fun. And then right after that, I have to go up and help my friend Wayne Keene in Cortez, Colorado. So I'm going to haul my trailer up there and I'm going to spend a couple days with Wayne. Wayne is also a potter, a very good potter. Um, so I have a lot of pottery stuff coming up in the next few days. And then hopefully I'll make some videos about all that for y'all. Um, Braun Wum. Thank you so much for all your videos. We have been looking for wild clay and hope to try this ourselves soon. Your videos are very informative. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Miguel, wonder why the ancients put a rattle in the ladle. Isn't that funny? I know. And I have the rattle handled, or the rattle. I'll show you my mug. Hold on. Made the rattle bottomed mug in the um, Ancient Potters Club. That's our Wednesday night uh, Zoom class. Look at You hear it rattling? So that has a little, it has a little um, raised spot in the bottom there uh, that has rattles in it. And that, that rattles real good. I don't know. They like things that rattle. I think it's fun anyway. Uh, thanks. That was a cool series. Uh, thanks, Miguel. Der Waldmensch. Maybe pottery from different cultures. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's another idea. Uh, Brom, Wum. Do you lead test pottery? you plan to use in the kitchen. Um, no, I don't think your average clay has is going to have a significant amount of lead in it. I mean, maybe rarely. I certainly do use lead paint sometimes and, you know, like it's just like the manganese. When I use lead or manganese paint, um, I'm I'm certainly not going to eat out of that, you know, be smart about it. But I I yeah, I don't think I don't think your average clay clay comes with a quantity of lead. Uh, for the next challenge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you, um, maybe different pottery, different cultures. Yeah, I, I'm not averse to that. Um, Der Waldmensch. Uh, send me some ideas of different cultures that you'd like to see me do. Be real specific in your, in your um, tips. Ren Pixie, drive careful. Looks like Nora is going to do some serious water dumping. Oh, yeah, don't say that, Ren Pixie. I, I mean, I... <laughs> I like to see the desert get rain, don't get me wrong, but um, I do not need rain uh, on my workshop or on my filming a video up at Q, up at Hopi, no. <laughs> yeah, she's talking about tropical, we got a tropical storm heading our way, so um, we really don't want that. Uh, TJ, just remembered I signed up for your newsletter but haven't gotten the free Pookie video. How do I access it? Uh, so the, um, the Pookie video, um, when you sign up, it's done through MailChimp. Uh, when you sign up, uh, you get an email that says, um, reply to this email to make sure that, you know, you actually signed up for it and somebody didn't sign you up for it, right? Like if I hated you, like if I was your enemy, I could sign you up for a bunch of newsletters and you get a bunch of stupid newsletters. So when you sign up, you first have to respond to make sure that you actually agree to join that newsletter. So if that goes into the junk drawer and you don't respond, you know, you, you're not on my newslet, my mailing list. So check your junk mail if you didn't get that confirmation email, right? Then after you confirm, you will get another email from me. This one has a coupon code in it. Go to the website, purchase the make a pop, make a pookie uh, lesson, use the coupon code and it will cost you nothing. Okay. So um, that's how you get it. If you want that, go to my website, ancientpottery.how. Uh, sign up for the newsletter. You'll get a coupon code that you can then use to purchase the How to Make a Pookie for free. Maybe the rattle was so... To scare off the evil spirits. Yeah, it, Duncan, A. Duncan, it could very well have been something like that. I have no idea. Uh, Gremlin Hunter. Casas Grandes Pottery would be cool to see if you are 
similar to the Mogion. Yeah, yeah, I would love to make some cat. In fact, I have um, I have a Ramos polychrome uh, effigy vessel sitting on my on my kitchen table right now. Uh, I just painted it. I well, I finished painting it today, but I painted it in my uh, ancient Potter's Club on Wednesday night. So uh, every month we do a different project, and August was uh, a Ramos polychrome effigy pot. So. Um, yeah, that's good stuff. I'd love to go. I have an idea to go down on the um, New Mexico Chihuahua border and picking up some clays down in there that are similar to those. So uh, that's my idea um, and make a video about it. Haven't got to it yet. When the weather cools off, probably. Um, rattle sounds like rain. That's right, uh, Miguel. It may very well have had something to do with um, rattle sound like rain. Yep. Uh, Farpoint Station, $2. Were you involved with computers early on, BB? <laughs> no, um, I, 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 like when I was in school, only like super mega nerds were involved in computers. Um, and not that I wasn't a super mega nerd, but I wasn't into computers. Um, I was more into like the arts. So I was an art student and I was into graphic design and all that sort of thing. And computers were not interesting to me because they weren't graphical at that point. They were just a bunch of text. And then it wasn't until like the mid-90s when um, computers went um, what multimedia, right? So they had sound and they had colors and pictures that I got involved in computers. But yeah, I used to be a web developer. Um, I, I still am some, but it's just there's not much business. There's not much work in that anymore. Found the email in my promotions folder. Thank you. Good. Glad, TJ. All right, guys. Uh, I think that's all we got for the day. I appreciate everybody's comments. I really appreciate the um, the Super Chat Farpoint Station. Um, thank you guys very much. Have a good weekend.